Bonjour et bienvenue pour cette rentrée inaugurale de l'école du management euh, et de, de, de l'innovation. Euh, je vais d'abord vous demander d'accueillir monsieur le directeur de Sciences Po, Mathias Vichra. What a good mood, what a good mood, and what a fantastic group of students. Uh, because of the fact our DNA is very international, I will switch from French to English and from English to French. Madame la doyenne, chère Natacha, Monsieur le directeur exécutif, chère Florent, chères euh, équipes de l'EMI, cher Bruno Roche, cher Bruno, merci de nous faire euh, la joie et l'honneur d'intervenir pour cette euh, rentrée inaugurale. Chères étudiantes, chers étudiants, dear students, je suis vraiment heureux d'être avec vous aujourd'hui. Vous êtes 482 étudiants à intégrer l'un des 10 programmes et l'un des 8 doubles diplômes que propose l'école. Welcome and congratulations. Bienvenue d'abord à vous, élèves issus du collège universitaire, qui retrouvez Sciences Po avec, après votre troisième année à l'étranger. Je sais que vous avez vécu particulièrement des difficultés liées à la crise sanitaire et je voulais encore avoir une pensée pour vous parce que je sais combien ça a été éprouvant et combien vous avez dû faire preuve de résilience pendant ces deux années extrêmement compliquées. C'est également un plaisir évidemment pour moi d'accueillir tous les nouveaux, tous les, toutes les nouvelles euh, qui arrivent à Sciences Po pour la première fois. Vous faites désormais partie, toutes et tous, des 1255 étudiants que compte cette école, l'EMI, mais aussi évidemment de la communauté beaucoup plus large des 15 000 étudiantes et étudiants de Sciences Po et bientôt des plus de 90 000 alumni. Donc c'est une communauté large, importante, et ce sera pour vous un réseau déterminant. Vous êtes ici chez vous, et dans cette maison, dans notre maison, à Sciences Po, le projet est simple et ambitieux. Il s'agit de former des professionnels éclairés et engagés, prêts à prendre des responsabilités et faire face aux défis de nos sociétés. En un sens, réparer le monde. Tout un programme. J'ai eu l'occasion de le rappeler hier lors d'un point presse. Notre ambition collective à Sciences Po, c'est d'en faire l'université, l'école de référence mondiale en matière de combinaison des savoirs fondamentaux transdisciplinaires et de l'expertise professionnelle la plus aboutie. C'est déjà, d'une certaine manière, cette ambition qui guidait Émile Boutmy lors de la création de notre institution il y a 150 ans. Vous le savez, c'est une année très particulière puisque nous fêtons les 150 ans de Sciences Po. Les lignes de force dessinées par Émile Boutmy se retrouvent à la fois dans Sciences Po dans son ensemble, mais aussi, vous allez le voir, dans l'ambition et la stratégie de l'EMI. Je voudrais, je vous rassure, ça ne va pas être trop long, vous donner quand même quelques références sur cette création de Sciences Po en 1872. La France vient alors de subir une défaite très humiliante contre la Prusse. Et d'aucuns considéraient qu'il s'agissait d'abord d'une défaite militaire. Pour Émile Boutmy, notre créateur de Sciences Po, il s'agissait surtout d'une défaite de la pensée, d'une défaite des élites. Il considérait que les élites, qu'elles soient économiques, administratives, politiques de la France, étaient en réalité défaillantes. Elles étaient défaillantes parce qu'elles étaient dans une mentalité obsidionale, sans se comparer, dans une mentalité à la fois rabougrie et prétentieuse. Et donc, il s'agissait de créer une nouvelle université. The purpose of Emil Boutmy was to create a new university based on brand new principles. The four pillars, the four pillars at this period of time were, first, a multidisciplinary approach, the only one capable of taking into account the complexity of the world, combining history, economy, political sciences, law, That was the very purpose of Sciences Po. This is part of our DNA, the interdisciplinary approach. The second pillar has to do with an international openness. We need to be compared. The oxygen comes from international comparison and the study of foreign systems. The third pillar has to do with a training program that combines the best of academic knowledge with the best of practical experience by involving professionals and researchers throughout the programs. And last but not least, new methods 
centered on interaction in small groups and which entrust the students with a leading role. That was the beginning of reverse pedagogy. Emile Boutmy croyait avant tout au progrès de la science et pensait que, en alliant sans les opposer le savoir à l'action, Sciences Po pourrait marquer son temps. Si les défis ne sont évidemment plus les mêmes, sauf que la complexité du monde, vous vous rendez compte, vous, est encore plus grande en 2022 qu'elle ne l'était en 1872, nous avons, toujours, nous avons toujours en tête le projet de Sciences Po de notre père fondateur et nous restons à la fois dans une logique d'héritage et de dépassement. Indeed, as you well know, dear students, the world has reached a tipping point. COVID-19, the war in Ukraine, global warming, increasing inequality and poverty, the rise of populism, the digital divide. Our society, our societies, faces many challenges and it is no longer possible to postpone the burden of decisions and action to future generations. And in a way, in a way, when it comes to climate change, for instance, there is no future generation. We are, you are, already that generation. L'école que vous avez choisie n'est pas une banale business school. Son projet, qui trouve ses racines dans l'histoire de Sciences Po, reflète les enjeux économiques, sociétaux, sociaux, organisationnels et financiers de notre temps, comme ceux, et c'est un élément distinctif important, comme ceux de la création des arts et de l'innovation. Notre projet vise à former des managers agiles, capables de comprendre le monde et le transformer via et par l'entreprise. L'action dans l'entreprise est mise au service du bien commun. En un mot, et c'est un principe assez facile, pour nous, par exemple, la finance doit servir l'économie et l'économie doit servir la société. Les ambitions, par exemple, en matière d'ESG, en matière d'impact, sont aujourd'hui, vous le savez mieux que moi, tout autant nécessaires qu'implacables. La question n'est pas tant de savoir si les entreprises doivent s'y mettre sérieusement, mais quand vont-elles s'y mettre Quelles seront les premières à s'y mettre Et ce, pour plusieurs raisons. D'abord, parce que vous, vous, mes chers amis, je pense que vous n'accepterez plus à l'avenir de travailler dans des sociétés qui bafouent les droits de la nature et ne portent pas d'action manifeste en termes d'impact social et d'inclusion. Donc, au-delà même de l'éthique, pour des raisons de recrutement, si les entreprises veulent recruter les meilleurs, les entreprises devront aussi shifter. Ensuite, car tous les outils existent aujourd'hui, tous les outils extra-financiers existent au même titre que les outils financiers. On peut mesurer le prix de la tonne du carbone. Il y a des certifications mondiales comme Bicorp, donc, d'une certaine manière, l'extra-financier va rejoindre le financier. La question n'est pas « va-t-elle », mais « quand ?». Et la finance, de ce point de vue-là, est clé. Moi, j'ai un souvenir assez marquant, lorsque j'étais secrétaire général de Danone. Les services financiers de Danone avaient réussi à avoir un prêt de 2 milliards d'euros, avec 12 banques, et des banques assez mainstream, hein, 12 banques, et le taux d'intérêt baissait à mesure que la note ESG de Danone augmentait. C'est-à-dire qu'on pouvait avoir une corrélation positive entre un gain financier d'un côté et l'impact environnemental et social de l'autre. Et je pense que dans la transformation du monde, au-delà de l'indignation qui est nécessaire, au-delà de l'aspect politique qui est indispensable, le shift de l'instrument financier est absolument clé. Il n'y aura, aura pas de changement structurel sans que la finance, la stratégie, l'économie puissent muter. Et là, vous avez un rôle aussi absolument fondamental. Et c'est donc pour ça qu'à Sciences Po, avec Natacha, Florent et les équipes de l'EMI, nous voulons être à l'avant-garde. C'est pourquoi, à l'EMI, une place centrale est accordée aux perspectives transdisciplinaires pour penser le rôle de l'entreprise dans la société, l'économie et la politique. C'est pour ça qu'à l'EMI, votre formation s'appuiera sans cesse sur la recherche académique et appliquée. C'est pour ça qu'à l'EMI, l'ouverture internationale est clé. D'ailleurs, vous êtes de 73 nationalités différentes, You represent 73 nationalities, and this is key. This is a strong asset for our school. À l'EMI, la création, les arts et l'innovation sont au cœur du projet pédagogique, afin de former non seulement des entrepreneurs et des managers du changement, de l'incertitude et de la résilience, mais aussi des individus capables d'exprimer pleinement leurs capacités créatives dans tous les domaines. D'une certaine manière, une sorte de 
Creative School a hijacké notre business school. Et c'est heureux. Et puis, vous le savez bien, il y a deux transitions fondamentales. La transition numérique, la transition environnementale. Évidemment, ce n'est pas qu'un sujet d'éthique, ce n'est pas qu'un sujet de morale, même si, au cœur de ces enjeux, il y a évidemment un sujet de responsabilité, un sujet de morale. It has to do with ethics, but this is also a professional requirement. Parce que dans le futur, vos employeurs voudront aussi que vous soyez formés aux enjeux des transitions digitales et numériques. Et c'est la raison pour laquelle, par exemple, il y a un socle commun à l'EMI sur data et digital. C'est la raison pour laquelle, pour vous permettre aussi de maîtriser les transitions environnementales, de nouveaux professeurs viendront pour renforcer cette dimension. Par exemple, la finance à impact va être renforcée. Et c'est pour toutes ces raisons que, pour appuyer toutes ces avancées, que l'EMI, les équipes de l'EMI, ont décidé, avec moi, avec toute une série de professeurs, de responsables pédagogiques, de changer de nom. Alors vous allez me dire, il faut que tout change pour ne rien de change, parce que ça s'appelle toujours l'EMI. Mais non, puisque le I change. L'EMI, c'était l'école du management et de l'innovation. Demain, ce sera l'école du management et de l'impact. Alors, ce n'est pas simplement un ripollinage d'acronymes. C'est beaucoup plus que ça, et vous aurez l'occasion de vous en rendre compte. C'est d'ailleurs dans ce cadre, et je voulais encore le remercier, que nous avons vraiment la chance d'accueillir Bruno Roche, qui va vous faire une leçon inaugurale en anglais. It will be in English. Beyond Purpose, a new path to prosperity. Et Bruno va vous présenter à la fois la raison d'être des entreprises, pour l'individu, la place du capitalisme. Et il a, je le sais, puisque j'ai eu la chance de travailler avec lui dans mes précédentes fonctions, une vision à la fois très pratique et une puissance théorique remarquable. Il a créé, et il est le directeur de la fondation Economics of Mutuality, et il montre comment l'enjeu du partage de la valeur entre les différentes parties prenantes est absolument clé. Vous avez aussi la chance, sur le long cours, d'avoir une doyenne absolument passionnée, et avec une expérience forte, Natacha Valla, un remarquable directeur exécutif qui est arrivé il y a peu, mais qui vraiment s'est énormément mobilisé ces derniers mois, Florent Bonaventure, et je souhaitais le remercier, et puis évidemment toutes les équipes de l'EMI qui travaillent pour faire en sorte que vos programmes soient le plus en phase avec les évolutions économiques et avec vos valeurs, avec vos attentes. Les deux années qui s'ouvrent, je ne vous le cache pas, sont des années de labeur. Vous allez devoir bosser parce qu'il n'est pas de réussite qui ne s'obtienne sans effort. Ces années vous permettront évidemment d'acquérir des connaissances, mais aussi des compétences et de l'expérience. Et j'ajoute qu'à Sciences Po, on ne fait pas qu'étudier, on ne fait pas qu'enseigner. À Sciences Po, c'est aussi une école de l'engagement. Et je vous invite, en tant qu'étudiante et étudiant, à profiter de la foison d'associations étudiantes qui existent, dans tous les domaines. Dans tous les domaines. Et... Une partie de l'expérience à Sciences Po réside aussi dans ces liens euh, faits de solidarité, d'action concrète, et donc je vous invite évidemment à participer à cela. Vous allez aussi euh, pouvoir euh, avoir des conférences assez extraordinaires, puisqu'il y a des personnalités assez extraordinaires qui viennent nous voir, il va y en avoir dans, dans quelques mois et j'aurai l'occasion de vous en parler. Nous avons eu la chance, par exemple, quand le président Zelensky a souhaité s'adresser pour la première fois dans le monde devant des étudiants, il a choisi Sciences Po, donc c'est vous dire euh, le niveau... Euh, de, 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 comment, de dirigeants que nous pouvons, euh, auxquels nous pouvons accéder et donc profiter de tout cela parce que Sciences Po c'est aussi ça, il faut y bûcher évidemment mais il faut aussi profiter de cet écosystème je ne serai pas plus long, je vous souhaite euh, évidemment à toutes et à tous une pleine réussite je sais d'ores et déjà que vous serez heureux, je vois vos regards à la fois déterminés et pleins d'allant ça me fait du bien pour vous dire parce que je finis ma semaine de rentrée et je suis encore revigoré par une salle comme la vôtre. Et je vous souhaite surtout deux années de sens. Sens que l'on peut entendre à la fois comme signification et direction. Et en tout cas, à l'EMI, à Sciences Po, nous souhaitons donner du sens. Et I would say that when it comes to the purpose of our school, the motto might be be inclusive. Be sustainable or be irrelevant. Merci.
Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Directeur. Thank you, Mr. President. Je vais demander maintenant à Madame Natacha Valla, doyenne de l'École du Management et de l'Impact, de venir sur la scène. Merci. Merci Florent. Bonjour à tous. Bonsoir à tous. Thanks for being here. It's always the, the result of a, of a very, you know, strong team effort to get you as a crowd here. Uh, and you will stay for two years. We have to take care of you. Monsieur le directeur, cher Mathias, monsieur le directeur exécutif, cher Florent, notre directeur exécutif brillant pour, pour l'école et vous allez avoir l'occasion de l'éprouver euh, pendant votre, votre séjour avec nous, chère équipe parce que sans l'équipe, nous ne serions rien. Et cher Bruno, uh, dear Bruno Roche, thanks for being with us tonight, because uh, that's a very special day. The starting day, this day is a very special one. I know we met on Monday already, but it was a little, a little bit more informal. It was not in a sort of um, setting where what we were going to say would have a meaning that you would carry with you as the image of the school you're, you're, you're starting to To, to be at. So uh, it has a lot of meaning to us to have Bruno here. Mathias said it a little bit already. I'll say a few more words. Uh, but it's a very nice continuation after um, Lord Stern, who, for those who are returning, uh, gave the, 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 the lecture last year. It's also a very good feeling because for once, uh, we're all here. Uh, Lord Stern was on the screen last year. We still had, you know, bits and pieces of, of, of COVID, and now we are handling it, really being face to face. And I think that's a lot. That's a very, very strong plus. So you're lucky in comparison to those uh, students, uh, your, your ancestors who were here uh, two years ago and, and, and partly last year. Um, I, I'd like to, stay, to say I won't be very long because Matthias really said uh, the essence of what we are. Uh, what we were at the beginning, um, the school was uh, started, you know, not so long ago, a few years only. Uh, I'm the second dean of the, of, of the school. The first dean has established a foundation which is uh, solid enough to still be with us today, but it has evolved as well. It has evolved because, as, as the director said, uh, uh, it is a, a business school and a creative school. And it, it is, a, cette école assume cette double identité, cette combinaison d'identité, parce que cette diversité-là, c'est une force. And as I told you on Monday, diversity is a strength, and you are the strongest diversity we have. Uh, so you are our strength. And we try to match and to, lever, uh, to leverage this diversity with a quality of teaching which, uh, which matches your ambitions. And this is really the work of your uh, master's directors. They are really working hard not only to make sure that you feel good during the year, that there's no ups and downs, or if there are ups and downs that you have someone to talk to, but also, all year through, they are keeping the contacts with the community, not only of, of, of um, um, you know, resident professors, but also, and perhaps even more importantly as a complementary uh, crowd to, to, to our professors, the professionals whom you're going to learn, with whom you're going to uh, work, and who might hire you when you're done with us. Uh, so that's an ongoing work that they are doing, seeking you know, what, what the, the weak signals are in the labor market. That's also our job with, with, with Florent, to anticipate, yet you know, anticipate not too much because you're coming to the job market at a very specific point in time. So that's something you should be aware, aware of. Uh, the first thing I want to say, uh, I'm an economist, so I have to say a, little, a few words about the economic environment, which is ours today. Um, and, and, and it's an environment which is very special for many reasons. Very special because we've had a sequence of crises. I would start the sequence in 2008, but some may say it's a bit later. Some may say it was already there before. I think 2008 was a really, really a, a change in paradigm in international finance. A lot of question, questions were open, became known to the general public, uh, whereas you know, those worlds were, were, were evolving very, very, you know, in different universes. And since then, you know, a lot of realities from finance have affected the daily lives in a very, very uh, evident and tangible way. And then we had a sequence of crises. The one you know most is the, the COVID crisis, and now uh, the follow 
uh, the, the following the, 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 the Ukraine crisis. Um, and that means that for the economic environment, things are changing. Things are changing because the emerging world is very vulnerable. And why is the emerging world very vulnerable? Because you have many countries that have a very high level of debt, in particular public debt. And this debt is now, will need to be sustainable or made sustainable in some way. Here, we are speaking about the world, the, 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 the life and the opportunities of millions of people who will be in the hands of you, who will have to think that world and think about solutions to make sure that this debt crisis, which is coming, uh, does not you know, put those people in, in, in long difficult, those generations in long difficult situations. Our director was mentioning finance will have to find solutions that are new and innovative. For debt, for example, and take an example, we now have already now since a couple of months, a number of debt restructurings coming up. And among the solutions that are put forward by the international community, one of the solutions is called debt for nature. Uh, so we are going, some countries uh, will have the ability to say, I, you know, my debt, part of my debt is going to be cancelled because I cannot pay it back anyway. And my creditors will accept that with the money I save by not having to repay a debt that is too big for me, uh, if I use that, those savings to look after nature, to look after sustainable solutions for my people, uh, then that will be a win-win situation. This was invented from all pieces. Uh, 30 years ago, it was a pure concept. You know, there were a few academics thinking about it, but it was not really not in the toolkit of the bankers and the, and, and the international institutions who are dealing with it right now. So that's very concrete. Second point, inflation. I think I might say that you grew up without inflation. You're young enough to, for having grown up without inflation. Now, inflation is coming back. We are old enough for having known inflation, or at least having, l having learned about it in our, in our courses, something very tangible, very, you know, our parents had to go through a decade in the 70s, uh, which was, you know, good for some and bad for others. What does it mean for your, the value of your wage when you enter the job market? What does it mean for the sustainability of your income? What does it mean about inequalities? So all those things of the past are coming back, and you will have to realize what should be kept in terms of epistemology from the past, and there are very useful tools that we had put aside and that we can bring back, but you'll have to think about new tools as well. And one of the new tools, uh, I'll stop here because it's really Bruno's day today, um, one of the new tools has to do with the way we account for things, uh, extra financial accounting. Our director mentioned it, and this is something that you will have um, in your life with us, in your life at the school, we will set up uh, this year, if everything goes well, a, a, a think tank, a, a center to think about what does it mean, uh, extra financial? What does it mean for firms, for households? So you'll be at the edge of those, um, you know, of this kind of thinking, which is very concrete on the table of, you know, the commission in Brussels at the European level, on the table of some constituencies and stakeholders in the US who are very forcefully preparing new concepts, new frameworks. And that's when you prepare a new framework that is going to be very, um, you know, uh, very shaping uh, the future, that you have to be very careful, innovative, and you have to know what the, your values are, what the values are that you want to express by those uh, frameworks. Um, I'll stop here. There's a number of things very practical about your life at the school. I mentioned this extra financial uh, initiative. You will have every Thursday the Nocturne. I don't know if your uh, director spoke about it. We have a couple of people booked already. Alexandre de Rothschild. We'll have Yann Arthus Bertrand, uh, a violinist, um, uh, the African Fashion uh, Day, etc. So you'll have a, a mix of things that are representative of the diversity of masters that you, that you are enrolled uh, in. So Bruno, you're here because you've been brilliant at um, not only developing an intellectual framework, but also brilliant as, at showing that this is also not only a, you know, an, an, an a cadre éthéré, but also a business model. And this business model has to 
work within the framework of firms, within the framework of capitalism that has to be reformed. Um, and you also have a background in theology, which I, I think really makes uh, your contribution unique. So Bruno, the floor is yours. If you allow, we'll have a question and answer session at the end of your talk, but uh, please enjoy the, the talk and welcome again to the school. Well, good afternoon. It's good to be back, really. It's good to be back in person. Uh, the last time I was in Sciences Po was in uh, December 2019. I remember some faces, so uh, good to be back. And thank you for welcoming me. And most importantly, the I would like to start, of course, with uh, thank you, Natasha, for welcoming me. Thank you uh, for the staff. Thank you, Florent. I know you have a, a new job, so good luck. Uh, I think it's educating people is probably the most important thing you can do in life. And when I think about impact, it's really about impacting people. Because if you don't change people, if you don't impact people, the rest is really irrelevant. So yes, the topic of today is beyond purpose, a new path to prosperity. So we start with uh, traditional greetings. So dear Natasha Vala, dear President Mathias Pichera, dear members of faculty and staff, dear Florent, dear students. But I'd like to start a little bit, since we are together in the same room, I'd like to know more about, about you. How many of you are from Europe? Okay, how many of you are from Africa? All right, how many of you are from Asia? As you can see, the Asian border is a bit blurry, right? Australia? No one. N North America? Great. South America? Very good, very good. Antarctica? Yes, one, right? Okay, let's get it all right. Okay, so how many of you speak French? Hmm, pas mal. How many of you speak two languages? How many of you speak one language? Good. How many of you speak more than two languages? More than three? All right. More than four? Yeah, how many? Can you, can, you, can you mention them? Six languages. Portuguese, Spanish, yeah? Uh -huh. Right? And then, <laughs> as long as it's the language. So how many of you studied economy and society? All right. How many of you studied political humanities? Okay, politics and government. Okay, it's a good mix. And other? Okay, well, it's a good mix. All right. Well, thank you. So how many of you are Gen Z? Okay. How many of you are millennials? Yeah, okay. How many are of Gen X? Baby boomers? Right. Silent generation? Anyone? Okay. You know, I, I, I wanted to show you a video uh, which, is, was, which, which is a summary of a, of a large survey that Deloitte has been doing over the last uh, 18, 11 years which is about um, what keeps people uh, awake at night, their worries. And unfortunately, apparently the, the video doesn't work, so we won't play it, but uh, I'd like you to, to read it because it's a, it's a, it's a survey across uh, 11,000 people around the world. And it's a, it's a systematic survey across uh, every year. And it's a very interesting feedback, mirror of uh, what certain generations care about. 
And the key message is that your generation and the millennials are tired of being resilient. And they want support and genuine change. So you are not the leaders of tomorrow, okay? You are the leaders of today. And it's up to you now to take into account these challenges, which actually is the challenges of your generation, handle them. I tend to believe that we have to be faithful in our generation. The, the challenge of my generation and not the one of yours. And uh, my, my, my hope is that actually at the end of my lecture, you will, you will have more clarity about how you can be empowered to tackle the challenges of your world. 70% of you agree that the gap between the richest and the poorest people in their country is widening. Only 28% expect that the economic situation in their country to improve. And then and half agree that business has a positive impact on society. Your top four concerns, cost of living, inflation. Inflation is number one concern for the Gen Z. Climate change is the second one. Unemployment, but also the mental health of your generation. So there is a, an, an abnormal level of fatigue, emotional stress, anxiety in your generation. Surprisingly, your generation want more government action than Gen X or boomers. And it is, of course, a reflection that the business and, 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 and corporation have failed to address the issues of your generation. So you want more of government. How many of you agree with this very short analysis? Just one, two. How many of you disagree with this? No one? So I repeat, how many of you agree violently with this? How many agree so-so? Okay, so I will ask someone to be courageous. What is it that is the strongest point in, that, in, 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 this, in this analysis? I need to have someone who is courageous to take a mic and stand up. No one? Okay, I'll come back at the end of the lecture. Is there someone? Yes, okay, go ahead. My question, the question was, is there something in, the, in, this, in this analysis that specifically resonates with you in terms of concerns for your generation? Where are you from? South Korea. What is your name? Okay, thank you very much. Please. You have a good voice. Go ahead. Hmm. Hmm. is associated with low unemployment, so mm -hmm. obviously people had jobs, and also if the economy was growing, so obviously with inflation, they still could hope for a better future. But for us, it's really hard for us to really hope for the better uh, when prices are going up, but our income is just staying the same. Mm -hmm. so I think that's why we really think that it's an issue. Uh, especially really, that, that really applies to uh, where I'm from, from South Korea, because uh, the younger generation nowadays, they don't really want to have kids, they don't really want to get married, because they can't really hope for the better. And uh, statistics say that we're going to be the first generation that's going to be poorer than our parents. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, yeah, so that's why I think, uh, going back to the question uh, you asked. 
That's why I think uh, inflation and those kinds of measures are such a big problem. And that's why I think the younger generation feels that the government is not doing enough uh, to improve our situation mm. so that we can actually hope for a better future and build a constructive future. Very good. Well, thank you. So, just to be mutual with the rest of the audience, a few words about me, beyond what Natasha and Matthias said. So, I belong to the Gen X. I'm not going to give you my age, but I belong to a Gen X. But I am a father of millennials and Gen Z. So, I have a small sample of, uh, of representative of your question. That's why I'm very interested also to, have a, uh, to speak to your generation. And as uh, Natasha said, uh, I am Belgian and French. Now I live in Geneva. And uh, I, I studied actually economics and finance. My PhD was in option pricing, so I come, I come from a long, long way. But in parallel, I also studied theology. And my wife keeps keep telling me that I have a degree to make money and a degree to make sense of money. And I'm Protestant, so I have no problem with economic prosperity. I'm a former, I have, I'm the former chief economist of the Mars Incorporated Group. How many of you of you know Mars? Okay, you know what it is? We are making, they were making M&Ms, sneakers, right? Okay. So that group is an interesting group because it is a, it is a company that makes about $45 billion. It employs 100,000 people, but it's still a privately owned business, entirely privately owned, with no debts, and with, um, with the vision that Money is like cocaine. You don't touch it. I remember the, the founder of the company said, when you make money, just reinvest it immediately. Don't touch it. It's like cocaine. If you touch money, it's addictive, and eventually will kill you. And so eventually, the company grew by reinvesting between 99 and 100% of their profit into the business. So that's actually a form of capitalism which actually helps to be less irresponsible than others. And uh, I, I, I did this job between 2005 and 2020. And in 2020, just a few months before COVID, I, I founded a foundation in Geneva called the Economics of Mutuality, which is a project which I started in 2006 with Mars and Oxford uh, when I was leading this, uh, this function. So this is who I am. So beyond purpose, and I like to have, I mean, I know we are speaking among French people, so you have like three points, right? right? So we will have three points. We, we will try to define what is purpose. And I think before we do that, I'd like to quote uh, one of the quotes which was in the video of Deloitte. And that video said that eventually Gen Z, they said, we want businesses to do more, to have a purpose beyond profit and a positive impact on society to address wealth inequality to fight climate change, etc. But what is purpose? Okay. What is purpose? And how does purpose differ from identity? I know it's a philosophical question. I'm not going to give you a philosophical lecture. I'm here to give you a business lecture. But nevertheless, I want to spend a few, uh, a few minutes to define what it is. Because identity and purpose are, in a sense, the two sides of the same coin. You can't decide where you are going if you don't know who you are. And that is true for an individual, it is true for an organization, it is true for a nation. But what is identity and how you define identity? There are different ways of defining identity. What I like very much is that you, you tend to you know who you are in the eyes of the people who love you. Very often, people like to speak about themselves in a way that is self-centered. You will never know who you are if you're only speaking with yourself. You will never know who you are if you are just obsessed with you. You know who you are in the eyes of the people who love you. And you had the kindness to, to, uh, to introduce me as a theologian, so I will tell you a small 
story. Actually, it's more a Jewish story than a theologian story. It is a story of Moses. How many of you know who is Moses? Okay, Moses is in a sense the founder of Judaism. He's the author of the Ten Commandments. So this guy actually had a pretty good impact on society. Right? To you can argue that he, different, he, he indirectly influenced two thirds of the humanity, and that can, the Ten Commandments are like universal principles, which are actually uh, almost in every uh, in every uh, in every country, every nation. But this guy started with a very difficult life. He was a leader in Egypt. He was a prince of Egypt. He was a kind of a pseudo prince because he was uh, adopted by the queen of, uh, of, uh, of Egypt. So his biological, biological mother was a slave, a Jewish slave, and her uh, official mother was a queen of Egypt. And he did a wonderful career until the age of 40 years old. And then he had an identity crisis. He didn't know who he was. He didn't know if he was a son of a, of a slave or if he was a son of a queen. So there is a story in the Bible that shows that actually he killed an Egyptian. So maybe he wanted to kill her mother. And then eventually he went for another 40 years in the wilderness and he became a shepherd. So he moved from being a, a, a prince of Egypt to become a shepherd, a lost, an outcast. And it took him about 40 years to unlearn what he learned in Egypt. And then he's there at the age of 80 years old, completely lost and confused. He doesn't know who he is. He's actually a stutterer. He doesn't know how to speak. He's so confused that he doesn't know how to speak. And then there is a, an, a, an element of the story that at some stage, as he was um, looking after his sheep, he sees a bush burning. But the bush was burning, but the bush was not consumed. So he was very intrigued, because in, in, the, uh, in, uh, in the Egyptian tradition, fire takes its energy from what it consumes. And here you have a fire, which actually is, 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 is burning, but without consuming the bush. Very intrigued. So he gets to that place, to, uh, to the place of a burning bush, and then he hears a voice. And the voice tells him, I am. I am the one who I am. The ultimate name of God in Jewish tradition. Actually, it is the only time in the Bible that God reveals himself this way. So the poor guy who didn't know who he was eventually meets a God who tells, I am. But in the Jewish tradition, also the burning bush has the same letters, it's an anagram with mirror. So for the first time of his life, he sees himself in the eyes of God. Not in the eyes of Egypt, not in the eyes of the, uh, of the slaves, but in the eyes of God. So if you're a believer, you can ask actually to God who you are. If you're a believer, the best proxy is to ask who you are to people who love you, but who genuinely love you. And at that time, this man who was an outcast, who was lost, who was confused, receives his identity and his calling. And he became, at the age of 80 years old, he became the great leader that actually drove the people of Israel from Egypt the, the, the country of slavery and bondage to the promised land. That's an element of identity. I know it's a little bit outside an economic lecture, but I really wanted to share that with you. At a time when you are starting your studies, spend time to define who you are, because who you are actually will define your purpose. And you are unique in this world. Okay? There will never be someone like you in this world. And the greatest sin, in my view, is to miss a target or to meet your purpose. That's the definition of identity and purpose, in my view. So, which is true also for um, um, an individual, is also true for organization. And many organizations today, 
many companies, many, try to define their purpose as a communication strategy. They want to say who they are. They want to define their values. That's not purpose. Okay? Purpose is all about actually knowing who you are in the eyes of the other. I mean, I'm really sometimes upset with when I read the press and I read the, uh, uh, when I go on the website of companies, how much time and how much money is spent actually just for, for companies to, to, just to know who they are. We don't care who they are. We just care about what they do for the rest of the world. And that's the of purpose. So if we know, go beyond purpose, right? And we want to put purpose into practice. So the definition of purpose that we, we defined with, uh, with my team and uh, the team of Oxford and, and Mars is that in the context of, of a business or a company, the purpose of business is not to maximize profit. The purpose of business is to develop profitable solutions to the problems of people on the planet, not profiting from creating problems. I repeat that. The purpose of business is not about maximizing profit. The purpose of business is to develop profitable solutions. So profit is important, but it's not the end. But not profiting from creating problems. Okay? And that's the program of putting purpose to practice. Here, I make a bit of publicity, if you allow me. This is a, this is a book that I wrote with my colleague in Oxford, which actually has been translated this month in China. So many of you are from China here? Okay, so the book is, on, is, is available on jd.com. Okay, you can get it, okay. And actually, it's much cheaper than the English version. But the whole, this work actually, this book actually represents about 15 years of research and application about how eventually you put purpose into practice and how eventually this purpose becomes a tool to drive not only economic performance, but also impact. But you see, if you want to start with notion of purpose, you should start with a good question. Okay. It's all about questioning yourself. I tend to believe the more I'm aging, the more I believe that actually that what matters is not the answers that you give. It is the questions you ask. And I remember in 2006, I was just appointed, uh, I, was, I was there for about two years in my, in my new job at Mars, and I was involved in a conversation with, between the management of, of the company and the, uh, the board of directors. And there was a big debate between the, the board and, and the management. The board was worried that the company would make too much profit. It was very interesting, because usually shareholders, they lack profit. In this case, the owners, the shareholders, said, no, no, I'm worried we're making too much profit. And the, the vision was, you see, every, every, every business is, in a sense, in a value chain. And every chain is as solid as the weakest link. And if the weakest link breaks, and we don't know about it, the whole ecosystem could be disrupted. And actually, some businesses actually have, have gone bankrupt because of a collapse of a supply chain. So the owner of the company said, no, I'm really worried that we make too much profit. And of course, management wanted to make as much profit as possible. So it was a big debate. And eventually, they called me, and they said, well, Bruno, we have a problem here. You need to, to play the referee between the management and the board. And I say, what should be the right level of profit? So my immediate reaction was a bit of a lazy reaction. I said, well, okay, fine, I'm going to ask a, a management consultancy right, to, to come up with a benchmark. And we have Mars here, Nestle, Unilever, etc. And uh, the right level of profit should be somewhere here in terms of uh, the debt and the grass. But I said, no, no, I think it's something uh, uh, it's a, more, it's a more fundamental question, because of course, it is an economic question, because of course, companies need to make profit, right? And there is a relationship between profit and growth, but it's also an ethical question. In a sense, what are the principles or the moral principles that will apply to justify how much money I take from an ecosystem from which I depend? So I came back to the management, I said, well, I'd like to respond to these questions, but like maybe like a good rabbi, by asking other questions. And I said, well, you know, it's not a new thing, first of all. This question has not been new. This is a quote here from the King Solomon, who said, a man may give freely and his wealth will be increased, and another may keep more than his right, but only comes to be in need. This was written 3,000 years ago. So that question is not new. 
right? What is new is the context in which we operate. And you know what? When I started my research, that was a blind spot in the management literature. The only source of knowledge I could find was in sociology, in philosophy, in theology, but not in economics and finance. That was actually bad news, because you know researchers tend to be uh, lazy and we lack shortcuts. I mean, I wish we had actually some sort of, uh, of, uh, of, of research there. The only response we had was essentially what Milton Friedman wrote in 1971, that the sole purpose of, uh, of business is to use its resources and engage in activity designed to increase its profits. And actually, if you think about it, you could argue that it's an ideology. Because if you summarize the, uh, the economic theory of the 20th century, you have Marxism, which is all about remunerating labor at the expense of capital and the land, nature. You have financial capitalism, which is all about maximizing capital, financial capital, at the expense of labor and also the environment. And to some extent, you could argue that the, uh, the ecologist movement is all about remunerating the land, nature, at the expense of capital and, and labor. And in a sense, you see, you could argue that the first, the first ideology, Marxism, collapsed in 1989. Okay? You could argue, actually, that financial capitalism is about to collapse now. Because if it is, and that was the argument I give to my, to my management, I said, if it is natural law, it will continue and prosper. If it is an ideology, it will eventually collapse. And I think we are at a time when financial capitalism is showing not only it's, it's not a, a, a sustainable system, but also it, it's, if we don't change it quickly, we will actually, it will actually, actually uh, jeopardize the equilibrium of society and also destroy the environment. And Matthias Vichera talked about the concept of, um, of repairing the monde, of repairing the world. And actually, my first book was, uh, I called my first book, Completing Capitalism, Heal Business to Heal the World. So we have, to, we, have to be, uh, we have to be aware that actually business has so much power today that it could either repair the world or deteriorate the world. Unfortunately, that system worked very well. I could give you here like a small statistics. We've done with my team um, an analysis about the profit and growth of the last 40 years of the top 3,000 companies. The red line is the profitability of business, and the blue line is the, uh, is, the, is the growth of the top line. As you can see, actually, management has managed to take, to double the profit, to double the profitability of business, irrespective of the top line. And I remember when I did this exercise in 2008, even during the crisis in 2008, companies managed to increase the bottom line at a time when the top line was going down. So it shows actually that management has been trained to extract money, to extract financial capital at the expense of everything else. So it worked. It is typically what is called in economics a self-fulfilling prophecy. And it worked very well for the business. Today, the world top economies, 69 are corporations. Only 31 are countries. And I don't know exactly what is the market capitalization of a, comp of a company like Apple Computer these days, but last time I did it, Apple Computer has a market capitalization which is equivalent of the GDP of um, Germany, I believe. So you could argue that business nowadays have become de facto political actors. They have much more power and influence than nation state, but they are not equipped to handle the complexities that their um, size and influence confer on them. Another example of the remuneration of capital versus labor. As you can see, actually, capital has been remunerated very well over the last uh, 15 years. Okay? The people who are highly educated, like in this room, benefit a bit of it, right? They are the, uh, they are the, they are the stupid servant of capitalism. But the people who have, who have a medium and low education, they are the ones actually who benefit the least. And my argument, you know what? Is that there is the same proportion of idiots and smart people in every population, irrespective of the competition process. 
You can be, you can be, it's not because you are educated and rich that you are smart. It's not because you are poor and uneducated that you are stupid. There are the same proportion of idiots and smart people in every segment of the population. So what happens when you have a bunch of stupid rich meeting a group of smart poor? You have a revolution. Let's move on. Nowadays, it is pretty clear that we need about 1.7 planets to actually to sustain our economic model. And if the rest of the world, I mean, the, uh, talking about China, India, South America, Africa, starts to consume the way uh, the uh, G7 is consuming, we, we will need between eight and nine planets. So you don't need to have an APG in economics to know that this system is not sustainable. So the world has changed. And if there is one slide that you need, uh, should remember is this one. F the first element is that we are dealing with new form of scarcity. So when I teach economics to people who know nothing to economics, economics is relatively simple. Economics is the management of scarcities. Okay? Very simple. M economics is about managing scarcities. 50 years ago, financial capital was scarce. But natural resources were overly abundant. So it made sense 70 years ago to invent something called financial capitalism because we needed more liquidity into the system. Today, financial capital is overly abundant, but we have new form of scarcities in the area of natural resources, common prosperity, but our system hasn't changed. So we know actually that economic system will eventually move. Hopefully, that economic system will move through education, through research, through experiment, and not through, through, to, through a natural disaster or war, but it will change. And you are the generation that actually will see this change happening. The economic system is changing. Actually, I believe that what we are seeing now, and you, Natasha, you mentioned that we are entering into a period of systemic crisis, where crisis will become the norm and no longer the exception. That series of crises will have one outcome, which is a radical change of the economic model. And it's, it's a super important for you as a new generation to understand this. You don't put new wine into old wine skin. And what you will learn in this, uh, in this, uh, in, in, in this uh, school of management and impact is essentially how you become the type of leaders that actually will handle this type of new scarcities. I mentioned that the size and influence of multinational corporations. Today, Multinational corporations like Mars, like Unilever, like Apple Computer, are de facto political actors, but they are not equipped to become like political actors. That's why, actually, I think the, the combination between political science and economics is critically important for the future leader that you are. There is also a rising middle class. The estimate is that we have 5.2 billion people who will eventually become reach the level of middle class by 2030. It's about two-thirds of the world, and that means actually there will be a shift of center of gravity from the West to the East. And we probably all remember people of my generation, this book, The End of History, right, which was written in the early 90s. It was completely wrong, right? It is not the end of history. Today, uh, the concept of liberal democracy, economic liberalism, and human rights, which are actually the kind of the three pillars of Western civilization, are being challenged. And for good reason, because actually uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, economic liberalism, the system that we have developed, financial capitalism, is creating wealth, of course, but for a few, but it's destroying the environment and it's creating unsustainable level of inequality. And this actually has an impact on democracy, liberal democracy. So it's, it's very sad to see actually that even in countries like France, uh, only half of the population eventually vote, like in the US. And human rights are being hijacked by totalitarian movement. So we shouldn't be surprised, actually, why is this model is no longer attractive. That's a real question. I like this quote of Joseph Stiglitz, and I will read it. Like the dieter who would rather do anything to lose weight than actually eat less. This business elite 
which save the world through social impact investing, entrepreneurship, sustainable capitalism, philanthrocapitalism, artificial intelligence, market-driven solutions. They would fund a million of these buzzworthy programmers and fundamentally question the role of the game or even alter their own behavior to reduce the harm of the existing and distorted, inefficient and unfair rules. And in my view, the fundamental question is what should be the right level of profit. So, is there a future to capitalism? I know there are, there are some discussions about uh, degrowth and whether capitalism is still a model. My personal argument is yes, but not in its current form. Three inputs have always been essential to drive prosperity. In that order, it is the land that provides natural resources. It is the people who transform and add value. And eventually it is money that ensures the liquidity in the system. And actually money is an instrument that brings liquidity in the system. Money is not supposed to be a unit of accumulation. It is supposed to be a unit of transaction. And the tragedy is that money has become a unit of accumulation. And today, if we talked about uh, a new accounting system that is needed, in my view, to manage the transition from an economy that destroys the environment and creates inequality to a system that actually brings prosperity. The Aziz situation is that, in terms of measurement of the land, it's very rudimentary. We have some CO2 uh, markets, but nature is much more than the air. It is the biodiversity. It is um, the uh, organic and inorganic material. It is water. Okay. So CO2 is just one element. In terms of people, you know, when I started my research several years ago, I, 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 went, I went to the ILO in Geneva and they told me that actually in absolute numbers there are more slaves today in the economy than 200 years ago. So the way we remunerate people is broken and disparate. But in terms of financial capital, we are overly, overly effective. So there is a fundamental shift which is happening now, in my view, in terms of capitalism. There is on the lower quadrant, which is called financial capitalism. It's all about centered on the creation of financial capital for the company and its is, and is shareholders. And the relationship that exists in this kind of environment is a power relationship. That's why companies want to become big. That's why they want to have power. Because the more powerful you are, the more value you can extract from your ecosystem. And this is a power relationship. And the focus is pretty much the enterprise and the type of measurement or the key performance indicators are financial capital. My argument, and the argument of many, is that we are moving into a different form of capitalism. Some people call it stakeholder capitalism, some people call it conscious capitalism. I like to call it mutual capitalism because in our view, it is, the value creation is no longer focused on the company itself, but the value creation is focused on the ecosystem in which the company operates. And therefore, it requires a new role for finance, so an accounting system that takes into account different forms of capital. And in that particular paradigm, the type of relationship you can have with your stakeholders has to become mutual or reciprocal. I'll give you an example. If you want to, ex to, if you want to extract money from one of your suppliers, power relationship is enough. If you want to leverage human capital, knowledge. You can't get it through money. If you want to leverage trust, social capital, you can't get it through money. You need to establish a different type of relationship, which is what we call reciprocal relationship. So our argument is that a system or a company which is based on mutual relationship is superior in terms of value creation than a system that actually only relies on power relationship. Maybe the most um, Caricatural example is slavery. Slavery actually is a system that worked very well from an economic perspective. I mean, 
countries based, developed, constructed, uh, built empires based on slavery. But forget for a moment the moral dimension. Just focus on the economic dimension. It was, in terms of management of human and social capital, it was a disaster. Why? I mean, in, in this population of slaves, uh, you had people who could have been doctors, engineers, technicians. It's an appalling way of, 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 of leveraging human and social capital. And my argument is actually that we need to move away from a power relationship, which is financial capitalism, to reach a higher level of value creation, which is, requires a different type of relationship, which is mutual relationship. And that trend, which was already visible before COVID, is accelerating now. So now I'm going to get into a bit more details. Okay, what do we mean? What does it mean to have purpose and strategy? What does it mean to, for the company to, to operate within an ecosystem? What do we mean by non-financial performance metrics? What do we mean by the notion of a true profit? And what does it mean for you in terms of uh, leadership development? It is fundamental for the firm to understand on the right-hand side, sorry, on the left-hand side, sorry, that the firm operates with employees, customers, and consumers, competitors, shareholders, the community, the planet, suppliers. But most companies see themselves this way. They see themselves as being at the center of the ecosystem in which they operate. And then they try to find a purpose or a value mission statement. Our argument, and we've done this like dozens of times, that companies that choose to decenter themselves, remember the story about your identity as a person, you are who you are in the eyes of the other. Okay? That's true for a company. The company is uh, who it is in the eyes of its stakeholders. And therefore, when we work with companies, we ask them to decenter themselves. We say, no, no, you are not at the center of your ecosystem. The purpose of your company is at the center of the ecosystem. And you are one stakeholders among many material to the purpose. And so what is the purpose in this concept? The purpose is to produce profitable solutions to the problems of people and the planet, not profiting from creating problems. This is a generic definition. I'll give you an example of a, uh, of a pharmaceutical company that we, uh, that we have studied, Novo Nordisk. How many of you know Novo Nordisk as a company? All right. So Novo Nordisk is a company that actually is known for uh, uh, making, producing, and selling insulin for the treatment of diabetes. And several years ago, they had a, a, real, disc a real discussion among themselves, say, what is the purpose of the company? Is it to sell more insulin? Or is it to eradicate diabetes? You understand the difference? Okay. Of course, selling more insulin is good to treat diabetes. But eradicating diabetes is a completely different story. It means actually you have to develop partnership with a large number of other players, health companies, doctors, water companies, sports equipment. So, because diabetes is a multi, uh, multi-variable uh, disease, so eventually they decided to go on a journey to say, well, our purpose is no longer about centered on ourselves as a company to sell more insulin. It's about treating diabetes. So they developed this concept of ecosystem and orchestrating the different stakeholders that are material to this uh, uh, new purpose. And some of the relationships that develop were monetized, some were not. But eventually, at the end of, uh, of, of the journey, Novo Nordisk is one of the top companies, that actually, in terms of market shares, growth, and profit. And what is really interesting is that you see, it's relatively easy to copy a product. It's also relatively easy to copy a strategy. It's impossible to copy a relationship. So when you build a network of players around your purpose, and you develop this concept of reciprocal mutual relationship with your partners, you're building a very resilient, very resilient business that actually is almost impossible to copy. That's one of the elements of performance. The second element is that when you are clear about the pain point, 
that exist in the ecosystem in which you operate, and also the capabilities that exist in your ecosystem. Then you can make um, an assessment of where are the pain point. You have some human capital pain point. Now, human capital, we have to make a difference between human and social capital because human capital represents you as a person. Okay, your knowledge, your skills. Social capital represents the quality of relationship you have with others. And again, remember, human beings are social beings, right? Okay. So uh, we know who we are in the eyes of the other. Okay. So the, the notion of relationship matters tremendously. And this is the capital in itself. And of course, you also have natural capital pain point and also some shared financial capital pain point. So when you do this exercise, then you, have, you end up with a list of pain points, a list of opportunities that actually the company can decide to address. And I give you an example because we've been working with, uh, recently with, uh, um, with uh, actually with, 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 with a pet food company. How many of you have a cat? All right. How many of you have a dog? Hmm? How many of you have a cat or a dog? A cat or a dog? Okay, so it's about a third of the population. Okay. So you probably, when you have a, a dog or a cat, actually you often go, you often go to, the, to the veterinarian, right? You get your cat from a breeder, and uh, you, uh, you're, you're buying your, 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 your croquette either from a veterinarian or from a retailer, right? But you know what? When we did our exercise, we saw actually there was a, a strong deficit of, of, of trust and relationship, and a strong, very good, very, very difficult relationship between breeders and veterinarians. They hate each other. They despise each other. And you know the veterinarians is not, a, is not is, I mean, it's a, very, it's a very serious problem. Veterinarians have the highest rate of suicide. It's a very difficult, it's a, it's a very difficult, it's a very difficult profession. So there is a real, uh, yeah, real pain, a real, uh, real, uh, real stress. So that was one of the, one of the uh, um, um, pain points we identified in the ecosystem of pet food. And pet food is a big business, I can tell you. And eventually that was interesting because uh, if we had not done this exercise, the company had no problem with the breeders, and the company had no problem with the veterinarians. But it was completely unaware of the problem between the veterinarians and the breeders. There was a bridge, there was a break in the, in the, in, in the social network between these two. And simply by fixing this problem, right, which is actually a social and human capital problem, the impact on the well-being of, of, of veterinarians tripled in the course of six months. The, the level of trust of, uh, of the breeders the same, and the whole ecosystem became more efficient in terms of value creation. This is a very simple example. See what I mean? You don't need to be like sometimes rocket science, okay? Just a simple principle. But the real question now is that, how do you measure that? So I'm not going to give you a lecture on this because we don't have time, but just know that that was part of the work we've been doing for the last 15 years. We, we develop a series of KPI that actually are Simple, stable, and actionable in a business context. In other words, you don't need to have a PhD in sociology to understand social capital. You don't have to have a PhD in, a, in ecology to understand uh, uh, natural capital. You just need a solid MBA. It's, it's a bit like similar to understanding uh, um, uh, the, the basic principle of accounting. But what we discovered in our research that the way we measured this non-financial capital happened to be correlated with financial performance. And that was a little bit what Mathias said at the beginning. Nowadays, we have more and more evidence to show that it's possible to invest in human social natural capital interventions and that it's good for your business. It's not a charity business. It's really good for business. It's like when you invest in marketing or when you invest in, in R&D, it is actually a good business practice to invest in your people and in the planet. We are getting close to the end of my lecture, but you see, um, accounting, Counts. Today, um, one, of the, one of the reasons why we are not moving fast on the transition is because the accounting system are still, um, are still uh, uh, structured to handle a reality of the last 20 years. Today, profit is not defined properly. And that's why when you maximize profit, 
you maximize problems. I repeat that. Because profit is not properly defined, when you maximize profit, you maximize the problems associated with it. If you define the profit properly, then when you maximize profits, then you maximize prosperity. So what does it mean, defining profit properly? It means actually to internalize the positive and negative externalities that are related to the purpose that you are choosing for your business. So the, the company doesn't have to solve all the problems of the world. Okay? And sometimes I, I find a little bit irritating uh, this um, CO2 uh, fad. Because I can tell you, most companies, actually, that I've been working with, the biggest problems they have in the environment is not CO2. It is water. It is biodiversity. It is plastic. So, of course, they want to comply with CO2, and they do this. Okay? But if you, if you really want to have a scalable impact on the problem that matters, you need, actually, to identify what is a source of pain in your ecosystem. And that's why we are proposing here what is called a true profit. A true profit is simply the identification of the positive and negative externalities that the companies create and or destroy in an ecosystem. And we are using here a concept of accounting at cost because if you want to, uh, only for CO2 you have a market. Okay? There is no market for plastic. There is no market for social capital. So we, we, we try to be super pragmatic to say how much it costs to fix a problem, right? And it is that cost, actually, that gets into the, um, the P&L. That's why we, again, we call it true profit. And you know, some companies, I mean, we've done this exercise for like a, a, about 20 companies, and it's very interesting because for some companies, the financial profit is very close to the true profit. So they are responsible companies, right? But some companies is awful. I mean, some companies like just like way away, right? And actually, you know, the difference between the true profit and the financial profit is a very good indication of the level of responsibility that the company has. And of course, this is connected to the norms that are being developed at the EU and also at the global level. And I'm very, I don't know if you know that, Natasha, but I'm very pleased that actually my co-author on this topic of true profit is actually has joined the ISSB as a board member. So I, and, and we're also working quite closely with, uh, with EFRAG in, 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 in Europe. So we, are, we think actually that the reporting structure that is being set up at the EU level, but also at the global level, will eventually be a force to help companies not only to comply with a number of regulations, but also to take it as an advantage to, grow, to change their business model. And it is a single bottom line. It is not a triple bottom line. Okay? I don't like the idea of triple bottom line because the bottom line is, is, a door, is an opening door to confusion. You have a, a book for your shareholder, you have a book for, your, for the NGOs, and you have a book for the trade unions. Okay? At the end, it's very difficult to reconcile. I like the idea of a single bottom line. There is this... Uh, um, there is this, uh, this paper written by a friend of mine, Peter Becker. He wrote it about 10 years ago. He said, accountant will save the world. Okay? It's a HBR article that actually I recommend you to read. Uh, Peter Becker is a former CEO of uh, TNT, the Dutch company, and now he's the head of, uh, of uh, the WBCSD, which stands for World Business Council for Sustainable Development. So it's a coalition of about, I think, 150 companies that actually are engaged in transforming the business according to... Uh, to, uh, in line with also changing according standards. But also, the, the guy on the right-hand side, uh, uh, it's, it's a question mark. Do you know who he is? It's not Peter, by the way. Peter doesn't look like this. Hmm? Who knows who is this guy? Natasha, Natasha you say nothing. Hmm? Nobody? Maybe you, you want to say it? Hmm? <laughs> So Luca Pacioli, who knows who is Luca Pacioli? Right? Yeah, you know. Go ahead. Can you can you say? Yeah, could you... Attends, il faut prendre le. 
On va prendre le... Arrêt. Merci. Yeah, go ahead. What, what is your name? Matteo. Matteo. Okay. I believe it's the guy who invented uh, accountancy. Yeah. L'italiano? Uh, oui, mais d'origine. Je parle pas italien. Okay. <laughs> yes, he's a guy actually who invented, the, who invented in the 16th century the uh, double entry accounting. And actually, for, according to some historians, this invention actually was one of the inventions that propelled capitalism in the Western world. So today we are probably at a Luca Pacioli moment, at a time when actually accounting needs to be, uh, needs to reflect actually the change of society. And accounting has three components. There is accounting for cost, an accounting for valuation, and an accounting for reporting. And our vision with Natasha and some other people is to ensure actually that the three elements of accounting, accounting for cost, which is all about equipping business to allocate money capital where it matters, accounting for valuation, which is all about helping investors understand the value creation that's come from the allocation of capital, and accounting for reporting, which is eventually what government will use in the future to drive their tax uh, policy, the three must be aligned. The problem we have today is that the three are not aligned. There is a lot of confusion in that space. So you are in the right school because Natasha is actually uh, developing this uh, think tank called the Luca Pacioli House, which is all about to serve as a think tank to drive the thinking behind not only a change in accounting, but also uh, an alignment between the different elements of accounting. And you see, because I'm, a, I'm, I'm also a theologian, and uh, I like actually, and being Protestant, I like the scriptures, I was always amazed reading uh, the five books of, uh, five first books of, uh, of the Bible, with the Jews called the Torah, and the Christians called the Pentateuch, that there is one book, so these five books correspond to, if you like, the, the book of the covenant, right? It's all about God explaining how he wants to be friend with, with humanity. Five books. There is one book called the Book of Numbers. And the book of numbers is a book of accountant. It's all about counting, counting people, counting land, counting cattle, counting cows, counting money. So I was surprised actually that you see when, uh, when you change or when you set up a new accounting system, you are in a sense reinterpreting the covenant. Accounting will save the world, perhaps, but it is the responsibility of management schools to make it happen. And it is the responsibility of the students attending management school to be prepared to bring purpose into practice through strategy, human resources, legal system. But eventually, it's all about measuring because what you don't measure, you don't manage. Last word, company. Company actually is a word we use extensively in, a, in, a, in the English language. In French, we use enterprise, we use uh, society. But in, in, in English, mostly company. You know what company means in, in Latin? It comes from two words, companies. And companies, literally means the sharing of the bread. So when you manage a company, you're managing fellowship. Thank you very much. Any question? So we open the floor to questions. There are two mics on either ales. I know. If they shout, you can you can shout. You seem to be uh, strong enough to shout. What is your name? Camilleta. Nice to meet you. Yeah, speak up a bit, yeah.
So what's a way? Mm -hmm. It was about the identity. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to know if your definition of identity is just for an economic aspect, because recently I've learned that there is a difference between um, identity and image, mm -hmm. mainly when it's about the brand, the company. So um, I've seen that you put inside the definition of the, um, the identity, the fact that it's how people see us, how people see the brand, whereas um, I've learned that that part is linked with image of the brand. So I wanted to know if it's a different definition or... Okay. It's a good question, thank you. Thank First you. of all, I was talking about identity of, as a person, and uh, our argument is that what is true for an individual is also true for a group of people. And I was more interested in, um, in, 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 in provoking you at the audience to say, well, if you want to define your identity, it's, it is not um, an introspective exercise. It is about uh, how, how, it's about how the other perceive you. So it's not really image, because image has a, um, um, image is, it could, could carry some element of, uh, of, um, of um, falseness, if you like. Uh, but if you, are, if you are truly looking for the uh, identity of who you are, uh, then it is important to, uh, to have a dialogue with the other. And for instance, I give you a very particular example. When we do this kind of work with companies, we, we, um, we have developed a technique, a sociological technique, actually, that is probably well known in this, uh, in this institute, which is about, we ask, we, we ask the companies, well, who, who, should, who should we speak to about the definition of your purpose? And they, they gave us a list of, of stakeholders. And then we, we go and we organize a series of, of, questions, of interviews with them, but the, uh, the, the person who does interview is not allowed to use uh, other words that the person is using itself. So it's, it's, it's really about looking for the, uh, the true, I mean, the, the, as much as possible, the truth without any bias. And so that image is more about um, uh, the perception, right? Identity is about defining who you are and with the purpose of developing a relationship, okay? Okay, thank you. Pour ceux qui veulent poser des questions, merci de vous mettre devant le micro, devant un des micros dans chacune des deux, des deux ailes, et on, on vous prendra à la suite. And you can ask questions in English or in French. Oui, ça très bien de parler français aussi. Mm -hmm. Oui. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm continuing in English so that everyone understands. Okay. So, um, hello everyone. Mm. Hello, Mr. What is your name? Posh. What is your name? My name is Ilura Kunavai, and I'm from the Master of International Management and Sustainability. Okay, so, good, yeah. okay. So first of all, of course, thank you for the, the class. That was surprisingly more impactful than I thought it would be, more about sustainability. So mm. this is my master, so I was quite happy about that. Mm. And um, I wanted to go back again on what you said about the context of climate emergency, the context of um, actually you know, this kind of purpose, asking the purpose of the company. And I had this question of, do you have any advice when us as analysts, as consultant, as future bank employees, how we will be able to actually tell the company that you actually lack purpose? How will we tell it without actually being fired or <laughs> without actually being silenced? How will we be bold enough to tell them this truth that is kind of hard to swallow, let's say. Yeah. Well, I sympathize because I, you know, when I started this journey 25 years ago, it was not even um, on, um, on the agenda. It's a kind of question. So, uh, for the record, I've been fired twice. Hmm? <laughs> yeah. Is but I've been. But before I, I left the company, I was rehired. Um, so, uh, so sometimes you need to have courage. I mean, you need to fix for yourself the red lines. Uh, 
You know, one of my, one of my uh, earlier uh, mentors, when I was about your age, uh, gave me this a very good example. He said, you should never be driven by the dysfunctional desire of other people. I can repeat that. Never be driven by the dysfunctional desire of other people. And you will, you will, I mean, every organization has some dysfunctional behavior. And there is, of course, a limit to how much you can take this. But in the end, that's my advice. Don't be driven by the dysfunctional desire of a boss or of an organization. Having said that, I think it's also, I mean, the vision we have, and I had this conversation with actually a colleague of you, uh, Sumitra Dutta, the new dean of, uh, of Said, and he said, uh, you need, one of the challenges we have sometimes is that when you want to teach this kind of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of principles, people want to go to social business. Or like, but social business are very nice, but they don't scale. Okay? So they eventually, they have little impact. So what we want is that you, you guys will end up working for Apple Computer, for Amazon, for Goldman Sachs, and you will be the, you see, the, uh, the seed, actually, that actually will eventually uh, uh, contaminate, but in a good way, uh, the, uh, the system from the inside. But it's all about actually also, my advice, and it's also advice I, I, apply for my, I receive and advice myself, that always try to understand, um, try to be positive. So it's important to say, that if people understand that you have the, uh, uh, that you have, a, uh, that, that you care for the company, that you actually it's not about you or about criticizing, but that you really matter about uh, the success of the organization and you are bringing your perspective. I mean, sometimes it's just this, this actually, I could, I could see, I mean, I remember I won some arguments just because it was not, I was not fighting for me, I was fighting for the purpose of the company. So again, decenter yourself when this happens. Mm. Okay. Thank you very much yeah. for this event. Thank you. Mm. Hello. Hi. Uh, I don't... Bonsoir. Oh, it's working. Okay. Hi, thanks for the interesting talk. Um, I guess my question is not, not that different from what the person before me was asking, but uh, it's about accountability. Um, this idea of businesses being the drivers of sustainable change makes sense, but it's also a little scary because uh, there's not much, there's no checks and balances really for companies. There's not much holding them accountable. Uh, like in a democracy, we, mm. we elect our, our government, but are we meant to do the same with CEOs? And I guess my question is, uh, who's gonna hold companies, the who, businesses of tomorrow so who accountable? Would, who what, sorry? Who's going to hold the businesses of tomorrow accountable? I think at some stage, I mean, I think it's, um, you're talking here of a systemic change, right? So I think a systemic change uh, needs to take place on, on different pillars. I think the very first pillar is education. I mean, you, you, wish, you would be amazed that people of my generation, they don't know. I mean, most of them don't know, and, and when they know, they don't, they don't see it as important. So there is, for people of my generation, there is, they need to unlearn, okay? For your generation, it's a bit easier. So education is number one. Uh, second element is really about um, leadership, courage, and not every, not every leaders in large company have the courage, actually, to, transf to, uh, to transform their business. So my, my advice to you when you apply for a company, just uh, pay attention. To, uh, to, the, to the quality of leadership, because it's it, it, it really what matters. The third element is about finance. Um, I think management is not enough. Eventually, the capital market is still today uh, a driving force. And um, as part of, uh, of the foundation we created in Geneva, we are actually creating this month a private equity fund. Because uh, uh, and I managed to convince, actually, I was amazed, I managed to convince the, 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 the guy who wanted to redo private equity with me to say, uh, you will make a donation to the foundation, and with the donation we will capitalize a company that will eventually do the private equity, so that there is no, no confusion. But you see, I hope actually by, by, by showing that responsible business practice doesn't mean uh, lower 
economic performance. But it means economic performance and impact. So that is the third pillar. I mean, uh, if you want to go to finance, it's possible, but go with this mind, with this uh, um, um, ideas in mind. The fourth pillar, in my view, is what you talked about, is government and regulation. So I'm, I'm quite pleased to see today that there are some uh, movements which, which are really about setting up regulation. The EU, to that extent, is very advanced, much more than the rest of the world. And we don't have time, but you have this concept of double materiality versus single materiality, which is super important. So pay attention to that. I think uh, regulation can work. Because in the end, in my view, I may be wrong, but you see, in my view, regulation will be the way government will choose uh, to monetize the negative externalities. And uh, in the end, companies will have to pay more taxes because they misbehave. Today, governments are looking for money and uh, uh, taxing uh, Taxing, taxing uh, consumption, taxing work is not very popular. But taxing the bad guys is super popular. So I can see actually uh, uh, like an opportunity for government to, when they have set up this uh, kind of taxonomy to uh, understand who are the bad guys and the good guys, they can use it actually as a way to tax the bad guys. And that will be super popular. So I think, in my view, education, what you're doing here, and uh, government regulation are the two most uh, strong pillars to move the agenda forward. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, how much more time we have? Five minutes, okay. Hi, uh, good evening. Thank you for the very insightful uh, presentation. Uh, I had a question that when it comes to mutual capitalism yeah. or the stakeholder theory, are there any special layers or like responsibilities for the luxury industry? in particular? Yeah, I mean, the luxury industry is actually, is, is, I mean, uh, I'm not allowed to disclose anything, but we are working for a large luxury company. And it's super interesting, because actually, there is one thing about luxury company that actually they tend to um, pay attention to uh, the skilled labor. And, uh, and they, have, they make a lot of money. So they have the means actually to maintain uh, a very healthy, network of stakeholders and remunerating them properly. So I think the luxury companies, more than any other company actually, have not only the duty, but the opportunity to be a front runner in this kind of, uh, in this kind of uh, transformation of capitalism. Thank you. Hmm. Well, maybe you can take one, one more question, maybe? Yes, yeah. one or two, yeah. one, short, uh, one long or two shorts, hmm. basically. Okay, <coughs> I'm glad I have the long one. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm a uh, I'm doing corporate strategy mm -hmm. here at Saints Bowl. Um, I'm quite puzzled by the presentation. It doesn't seem like other people are, but if anyone else is, I really would like a conversation. But for now, um, uh, is there uh, the, the unusual form of capitalism you are proposing or the future? Uh, is it? I wonder. Is it really practical uh, in terms of? Um, I, I am a believer in aligning in systems work when incentives are aligned. For businesses to go to that path, what are their incentives? And I come from um, uh, Ethiopia, an emerging economy. So for us, uh, private sector involvement and recently capital markets is music to our ears. Mm -hmm. um, we had uh, non-profits uh, for 50, 60 years in, our con in, uh, in Ethiopia and in Africa. And uh, I can say it's, the results are really bad. And uh, the more private sector involvement is, the better the life is from my experience. So is this move to the future of capitalism uh, in the same path for uh, emerging economies and already established economies? Or is it, or is it different? Or what's your take on it? Well, we see the, the first, uh, the first uh, pilot we did... Uh, initially to test this, uh, this economic model was, with, uh, was actually an East African country. Um, and then we tested it uh, also in, in West African countries, in India, in China, in the Philippines. So we had, a, in Mexico now, and uh, so we have a good, uh, good understanding of how this kind of uh, model works in, uh, in, uh, in emerging market. And actually, my view is that sometimes emerging markets are, can leapfrog, uh, in a sense, if you like, the, uh, the, uh, the, the concept. And, uh, and actually it can be a role model for a mature market. Actually, my experience is that actually, because we tested it in very difficult business conditions, like in East Africa and, uh, and Southeast Asia, that eventually, and it, it worked. 
Uh, of course, it was smaller scale, but it worked very well. It was profitable, it was creating social human capital at the same time, and it was creating uh, like a very decent level of profitability and growth, right? So eventually, the, the mature market picked it, and now, of course, it's, it's more like a, a global, I mean, it's, it's a methodology that actually uh, applies globally. But it's super practical. I mean, I encourage you to go on my website. I mean, I'm coming from a, from a company which sold Mars bar, chewing gums, uh, uh, pet food. So you, you can't be more uh, practical than this. And I remember when I was living in Brussels, uh, just for the anecdote, uh, some days I was felt a bit miserable and, uh, and my company had actually 50% of the pet food market of, in Belgium. And every time I saw a poop on the, on the streets, I said half of this poop is mine, okay? Mm. So you can't be more pragmatic than this. And actually this is what we're doing. Mm. On these words, uh, mm. I propose that we continue the conversation outside because we have a cocktail. Um, so, uh, voilà. Thank you. Thank you. Donc, un, un immense merci à Bruno Roche et on se retrouve dehors pour le cocktail. <laughs>